Please remain standing for scripture. We're in Psalm 100 on page 606 of the Pew Bible. Psalm 100 on page 606. Sherilyn, thank you for leading us in worship this morning. God's word is the sword of the spirit. So let's look at it together. Starting right at the beginning with the title. A psalm for giving thanks. Verse 1, make a joyful noise to the Lord all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. For the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever and his faithfulness to all generations. The grass withers and the flowers fade but the word of the Lord endures forever. Please be seated. just want to make a couple comments. Uh, First, I want to thank each of the uh, people who work on the slides. Um, I'm not going to remember them all right off the top of my brain, but Julie, Stacy, Kayla, Ashley. Did I get them all? Who am I? I got them all. Hey. All right. Cell five. I just want to say thank you to you guys. I mean, they're learning a new system. They're learning a new program. And sometimes that makes your anxiety just shoot through the roof when things aren't working like they should be and they're trying to fix all the things. And I know they don't want to let you down. So let's just give them a round of applause. Thank you for just your work. Some days like today, it's just like, man, I bet you're just stressing out. So it's, a, it's breathe. It's all good. <laughs> we still worship. Uh, Also, I want to thank uh, Dennis for reminding us about Mission Sunday. You know, the flags are all around me, and yet my brain is just... So I just thank you for doing that. Uh, This flag here represents Cyprus and and the work that the Siemens are doing. So just keep them in prayer. Uh, But as we look into this psalm, and we're coming upon Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving is a holiday that's built around, I think, a great idea. See, when it was first celebrated a few hundred years ago, people were grateful for God bringing them safely to America and for providing uh, produce for them to eat and, and survive off of. God's providence is just as important today as it was back then. Although I would contend, I would, uh, yeah, I would contend that it was probably a little bit more important back then. Yes, we depend on the harvest to produce food and, so that we can sell it and use that money to uh, uh, fund our livelihood. However, back then, if they didn't have a harvest, they would literally starve to death that winter. They had no way of obtaining more food for them, even if they had the money or the furniture to sell for the money. They had no one else to seek charity from or generosity from in the midst of a difficult time. The first settlers that celebrated Thanksgiving either had food or they had death. At least today, we could probably last a little while if a harvest doesn't produce what we want it to produce. We could be supported by other people in a community. We could maybe utilize the food bank, or we could even sell some of our things to make ends meet. But it's because of our comfort and and security that Thanksgiving has developed in America to be a great idea, from a great idea, into a holiday of, well, contradictions. See, what was, me- what, what was once meant to be a day where we gather as family and friends to praise God for his providence has now become a day when we celebrate wealth and success. Across America, Thanksgiving is now a time to get together and kind of stuff ourselves full of food. It's a day to ignore family and friends and watch a football game. And I'll admit, I'm going to struggle with that this year because the Vikings are playing the Patriots on Thanksgiving Day. See, corporate America has slowly turned Thanksgiving weekend into a time of overspending, overextending, and overreaching our finances. Black Friday turned into Black Thursday evening, and I'm sure soon Black Thursday, or Black Thanksgiving. Not to mention all the deals that will be going on this week. See, Thanksgiving in America has has become kind of a contradictory holiday. And so the encouragement for all of us this year is to return to the foundations of Thanksgiving. It's time that we reclaim what Thanksgiving is meant to be. 
We may not be able to influence the rest of the nation. We may not even be able to influence the rest of our communities. But for us, we can return to what Thanksgiving should be, a time of thankfulness, a time of gratitude, a time of praise and recognition of what God has provided for us. And if we're going to do this, if we're going to do this well, then we need to ask the question, how should we give thanks to God? Well, let's look at this psalm again together. The first thing to notice about this psalm is its title. We see that this psalm was meant or written for the use of giving thanks. Now, this is the only psalm in all 150 of them that bears this precise inscription. It shows that this psalm was a hymn to be used in a worship setting. Now, when I'm choosing hymns for us to sing for Sunday mornings, one thing that is just implicit in this process is that I'm telling you that these songs are good songs to use worshiping God, that the words and the songs and the, and the things that they affirm speak truth about God. You know, I take that responsibility very seriously. I will be accountable to God one day for all of the songs that I've asked you to sing about him and to him. See, the title of this psalm, it's doing the same thing. We're being told that these words are good to use for giving thanks to God, that they will say proper things about God in a spirit of gratitude. So what are these things that are good to say for giving thanks? We'll look at verse 1. It says, Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. See, we're invited to praise God. This is like the, the blowing of trumpets as the king arrives into the city. This is a summons to express loud joy. See, the words joyful noise means to raise a shout, to give a blast, or let loose a battle cry in the Hebrew. This is bold worship. This is courageous worship. This is how we are to give thanks to the Lord. And you'll notice in your translation that the words the Lord is all capitalized. This means that the personal name for God is being used here, Yahweh. So this worship, this bold, courageous, joyous, thankful, battle cry, shout of worship is directed to our God who reveals himself personally to us. We have a personal relationship with God that we are worshiping. You know, when my younger siblings marched in parades or, or walked in their graduation ceremonies, I shouted as loud as I could, mostly to embarrass them, but really to, to express the joy that I had in them accomplishing what they were accomplishing. I don't know if the kids remember it when Miriam, Obadiah, and Chloe walked in their gra uh, kindergarten graduation. I made sure to do the same thing there. See, this is a type of shout that is being described here. Giving thanks should be a public thing. We should be unashamed of it, no matter where we are or who we're with. And look at the end of this verse. The invitation is that the whole earth would join in with us. See, when we recognize the greatness of our God, we realize that nothing less than all of creation should join us in giving him thanks. We should be bold when we give thanks. Now jump down to verse 4 for a moment. It says, Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. See, verse 4 encourages us to come before the Lord in thanksgiving and praise. God's, God's gates and courts are open to all. Even the innermost court of, of his temple is now open to believers because of Christ. And so we are pressed to acknowledge this privilege in our worship. Now, at the time of this, uh, that the psalm was written, this verse was literally referring to the temple in Jerusalem. But on this side of Christ's death and resurrection, we should realize that we are in the presence of God wherever we may be. Whether it's in this church, whether it's at our home, whether it's in a barn, believers have the Holy Spirit inside of them. We are a living sanctuary. And so we can enter his, his gates and his courts at any time. And when we do, we should be joyful. God has blessed us. We should bless him in return. 
In the joy of our hearts, thankfulness must abound. Thankfulness, then, is marked by joy. It's our first point for today. Thankfulness is marked by joy. Now, for some of, the, some of us, this may be a, a hard thing to accept during this Thanksgiving season. You know, I think of the people who are working hard to host gatherings this year. I think of people who have experienced the loss of a loved one, even ever so recently this year. I think of the people who are struggling to get through the day and who struggle to make ends meet. I think of those with health concerns and financial concerns and family concerns and work concerns and marriage concerns and and the million of other concerns that are weighing on our minds. In light of all of this, thankfulness is difficult, much less being thankful and joyful. And yet here we see that thankfulness is marked by joy. How can we live this out? Well, first we need to realize that joy and happiness are two different things. You know, happiness is a feeling. It's a reactionary feeling that we have in the moment. Sometimes um, happiness, it happens that uh, it produces a smile, a laugh, a feeling of contentment and happiness. Joy, however, is an attitude. It's an attitude of our heart and spirit. It is something that we purposefully choose. Joy is deeper than happiness. You know, we can have joy even in the difficult times, even in in, in the times of grief. Joy doesn't need a smile in order to exist. It's a fruit of the Spirit. Consider Hebrews 12, verse 2, which tells us that Jesus, the founder and perfecter of of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising its shame, and is seated at the right hand of of the throne of God. See, Jesus endured the most horrific, cruel, and torturous death, and yet had joy. And in James chapter 1, verse 2, we're encouraged to count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. See, the trials of life that usually wear on us and and discourage us and, and beat us down, those trials are the ones we can count as joy. And Paul, in prison, constantly talked about the joy he experienced. You see, joy is based in God, whereas happiness is based in the moment. Joy is based in the eternal. Happiness is based in the temporary. God, grief can replace happiness, but joy sees us through the difficulty. Our prayer needs to be, Lord, grow my joy in you, even when the circumstances of life take away my happiness. Thankfulness is marked by joy. We must cultivate this in our hearts. But thanksgiving is marked by more than joy. Look at verse 2 with me. It says, Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Here we see a continuing of worship. The praise of verse 1 leads to the encouragement to serve and worship in verse 2. See, worship leads to service, and true service leads to worship. Romans 12.1 echoes this call. Paul says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. In the Greek, that last word, worship, can also be translated as service. This is your spiritual worship or your spiritual act of service. See, our whole life should be one of service and worship to God. And the important thing to understand is that service and worship, they're they're inseparable. Any service that we render is service that we ultimately render to God for the believer. This includes the very things that we do in our lives, such as uh, fix farm equipment or, or load hogs or drive trucks or build things or type things or harvest or call people on the phone and just to encourage them or to surround the people who are grieving during the season and support them. It is all an act of worship to God. It all glorifies him. And so in verse 2, it shows that we should serve God with complaining. Or is it begrudgery? Is that what your Bible says? Mine doesn't either. We should serve the Lord with gladness. 
We should be glad because of what God has done for us, what he is doing for us, what he'll do in the future. See, we should be glad because we have the ability to serve him in whatever capacity that we are serving him. But that's only half of it. It says that we should also sing. Singing is mainly offered on Sunday mornings, alone in the car, maybe in the shower. There are other times, of course. But in our singing, we should work to realize the presence of God. This is an act that we should take seriously, especially on Sunday mornings. See, when we sing, we should be consciously coming into the presence of God. Thankfulness is marked by worship. It's our second point for today. Thankfulness is marked by worship. What is inside of us comes out. The attitudes of our heart and the thoughts of our mind will be revealed in what we say and in what we do. See, when our inner self or when our inner attitude is, is pessimistic and, and judgmental, we will speak and act in overly critical and negative ways. But when we pursue thankfulness and joy, when we pray for greater growth in these attitudes, when we remind ourselves of the goodness of our God and the mercy that he has shown us, when we remain humble before God and others, when we purpose ourselves to, be, uh, to show true biblical love for God and others, then what comes out of us will be encouragement, support, honor for others, and praise. See, worship is the natural response of the thankfulness in our hearts. When we truly see who God is and what he has done, we long to worship him. Thankfulness is marked by worship. But we need to realize, too, that worship is more than just an expression of joyful praise. You know, the book of Psalms in the Bible, uh, it's a collection of the worship songs. And over one-third of them are songs of lament. See, just as we can have joy in the midst of grief, we can also worship God in the midst of grief. We can and should worship God when we are going through storms of life, when we don't know which way is up, when everything seems to be crashing down around us. Worship is a choice we make, just like thankfulness and joy are choices we make. By worshiping God, no matter the circumstance, we take the focus off of ourself and place it on the one who loves us. Set your mind on things above, not on the things that are on earth, as Colossians 3.2 tells us. See, in the midst of this season of thanksgiving, no matter what the circumstances we find ourselves in, we are reminded that thankfulness is marked by worship. Let's look at the last final mark of thankfulness in this psalm. Look at verse 3. It says, Know that the Lord, He is God. It is He who made us, and we are His. We are His people and the sheep of His pasture. See, here we are invited to know something that underlies all the other actions in this psalm. Yahweh is God. This is the apex of the psalm. The first two verses lead up to this. The last two verses flow out of it. Yahweh is God. And then, and then follows instructions about him and about us. It is God who made us. We didn't make ourselves. Random processes didn't make us. No, God made us. And thus we are his. We are his people. We are the sheep of his pasture. The question of our identity begins and ends with God. You know, Paul teaches the same lesson in 1 Corinthians 6. 19 to 20. He says this, Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. We are not our own. This is a difficult lesson for us to, to hear and to get across in our culture because our culture focuses on getting what we want when we want it. But God's word shows us that our lives aren't simply ours to live. A genuine life is found in submission to God. 
In fact, knowing that we belong to God and, and that we are not our own is, is a reason to enter his courts with thanksgiving and, and praise in verse 4. See, not only should we accept this fact, we should celebrate it. And thus, the psalm is a little bit circular. To know God is to praise God, and to praise God is to know God. But the psalm teaches us a little bit more about God. Look at verse 5. It says, For the Lord is good, his steadfast love endures forever, and his faithfulness to all generations. This verse is tied to verse 4. Verse 4 says, Give thanks to him, bless his name. Why? Why should we do that? Because verse 5 says, The Lord is good. The word good sums up all of God's character, and it's the foundation for uh, the other two attributes here. See, out of his goodness comes his steadfast love. Steadfast love is also translated as mercy. God's steadfast love, or his mercy, is everlasting. He is not only uh, justice, he is also compassionate. And his faithfulness is to all generations. Our ancestors found him faithful. And so will our children and our children's children and so on. God's faithfulness is good. And it has been constant throughout time. And you know, a changing God would be a very scary thing. If God changed, if God changed his mind, we would have no anchor. We would live in constant fear of perishing. But thankfully, that is not what is true. God has never broken his word or changed his purpose. And the word faithfulness is from the Hebrew word amen. It means to lean your whole weight upon it. God's faithfulness is something that we can completely rely upon. This is the goodness of our God. Thankfulness is marked by knowledge. That's our third point for today. Thankfulness is marked by knowledge. And you know, following Christ isn't based in our ignorance. The world seeks to convince people that this is true, that believing in Christ means that we are uneducated and, and ignorant people. But that is not the case. In fact, the entire opposite is true. See, we follow Christ and we grow in maturity in Christ as we increase in our knowledge. We all start at the point of recognizing that God is holy and by comparison, we are not. We are sinful. And we can do nothing to change that. But God sent Jesus into the world to die in our place and three days later to rise again. We've learned that if we confess that Jesus is Lord and believe that he rose again, we will be saved. And from that introductory knowledge, we spend the rest of our lives learning more about the God of the universe, his will for us, his design for everyone, and so much more. God doesn't ask us to blindly follow him. No, we are constantly encouraged in the Bible to attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children, as Ephesians 4, 13-14 tells us. We are to mature, and we are to mature in knowledge. That's why thankfulness is marked by knowledge. You see, as we grow to know more and more about God, we are given even greater reasons to thank Him. When we learn that God is faithful even though we are not, we thank Him for His faithfulness and every time He proves His faithfulness to us. When we learn that God provides us with life and breath and sustains creation, we thank Him for His providence and for each day that He gives us. When we learn that He is merciful and forgiving and gracious, we thank him for his compassion towards us, especially after each time we confess our sin to him. Great knowledge of God produces greater thankfulness in us. Thankfulness is marked by knowledge. You know, Psalm 100, it's a simple psalm. It's a short psalm, and I bet you're all surprised that I've talked about it for so long. But it gives us guidance to how to give thanks to God. Thankfulness is marked by joy, worship, and knowledge. It's our big idea for today. Thankfulness is marked by joy, worship, and knowledge. This one's straightforward. The three points that we covered make up the big idea. But just because it is simple 
Do not let its importance be lost on you today. Because inherent in this passage is a warning. See, if we don't pursue gratitude, then the opposite of joy and worship and knowledge will mark our lives. We'll be marked by despair and selfishness and ignorance. And those things will destroy our relationship with God and with others. So to apply this passage to our lives, we first need to pray for growth and thankfulness. This is an attitude that needs to develop and grow for all of us. Even the most thankful person can grow in this area because we have so much to be thankful for. God has blessed us with so much. Next, we need to worship together. This whole psalm encourages us towards this. So let's continue to join together and to raise our voices in thanks to God. And lastly, remember that God is with you, whether you're giving thanks to him or not. See, this is especially for those who are struggling this year. There are many who, find it, who may find it difficult to be joyful or to, or to worship or to be thankful. But know that God is good, that his love for you endures forever, and that he remains faithful to you even in the midst of a storm. He will never leave you or abandon you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, as we close this time of of worship and of looking into your word, I pray that you would grow thankfulness in our hearts, that we would find reasons and find ways to show our thankfulness to you. Lord, we know that you have done so much for us, and sometimes the the things that are going on in our lives tend to blind us to what you've done. But Lord, we still know that you are good and that you are faithful. So Lord, be with each person here. Guide them as they go throughout this week. Help them to uh, support each other. Help us all to be the body of believers that you've called us to be. And Lord, um, even for those who um, will find it difficult to give thanks this year, Uh, I pray, Lord, that um, they would still experience your love and faithfulness, that they'd still experience the encouragement from friends and their body of believers that come around them. Would help us to walk with people uh, through this season. And Lord, um, to gather with friends and family and to point each other to you. Guide us this week. It's in your name we pray. Amen.